good evening again. A week has went by and we today are going to share the second part of the show um, in answer to your question. I would like to recap for you what we did last uh, week. We heard from Daryl Sims in uh, about four or five years ago that led up to the NBC program that was done on the 17th of um, February. We also heard from Al Bialik. And today we're going to go to Mr. Adair and to Preston Nichols. We will be talking about back engineering and why we are able to jump time the way we do occasionally. Um, with me again are my guests, Carol Wright and, and Barbara. And I will promise you, there will be a time you meet another sister and a brother because you have a whole family full of gifted people. And yes. um, mm -hmm. there's a whole lot of you there. Yep. So, and I promise I will introduce all of them to you. What I have that I want to share with you today is it's just a little trinket from Africa that when I get real discouraged about things, actually I'm going to turn it this way. It just keeps balance because in this day and age, you know, like Nancy Williams said on the show, uh, let me ask your age, we are human beings, not p human doings. And sometimes we need to remind ourselves that we should just chill out, so to speak, okay? And when I get real frustrated, I just, I just tap this thing here, and it just seems to keep balance no matter what, unless, of course, you tilt it, and you see, you can go quite a ways with it. <laughs> <You're And right. laughs> so keep in mind, keep your balance. You won't need a drink tonight because there is no graphic material, and hopefully this will be a little lighter and a little enjoyable. So I'm going to put him back down here. There is a man, his name is uh, David Adair. He was requested to testify for Congress about some of the things that he had seen. Now, Barbara and Jim Clarkston, the Grace Harbor County UFO section director for the UFO, uh, for Move on the UFO and the UFO Reporting Center, we did a show on the road the other day, and it was called Finally June Kaba, where we told the story, he told the story, yes. who yeah. June Kaba was, how she got where she was, and, and the things that she did at Wright Patterson Air yeah. Force Base. That's right. Okay. Now, you will probably recognize some of the things that June Carver, this June Carver story talked about in David Adair's interview he, he did with Brenda Roberts, my friend that has a show named Journey. So I think what we like to do is, um, did you ever meet Brenda? No, I never got to meet her. Uh -uh. You didn't? Uh -uh, not yet, no. Wonderful lady. She, she did a lot for people. She taped over 300 shows. And she eventually just ran out of money and things yeah. to do. So unfortunately, one of these days we'll have to jumpstart her again. Right, okay. absolutely. And you wasn't living here long enough, so I do know you haven't met Brenda. Okay, right. but you will one day, I promise. That's good. So, without further delay, maybe we could play a David Adair's interview, and I believe it is 23 minutes long. And the interview is conducted by Brenda Roberts from Journey TV. And you'll find this gentleman very, very enjoyable. In fact, we had a couple of laughs with him. All right. Yeah? Uh -huh. Okay. So if we could maybe run that now, thank you. Thrilled to hear you at the Whole Life Expo as a scientist speaking in such hard-hitting terms <laughs> about what's going on and, and what you know. How did you you know, come to speak about these things, because do you, do you feel like you're like on the edge of, of not it being very safe for you? <laughs> um, well, no, th I really don't pay much attention to the paranoia that, that can be attached to all that. Uh, what really brought me forward was that um, mounting evidence and stuff mm -hmm. that keeps showing up, and to, it's at a point where it's like um, 
it becomes like a fingernail on a chalkboard. You just can't ignore the sound. Irritating. Yeah, and, and finally, in our 3D dimensional world of science, mm -hmm. we're looking at stuff that um, it's, the evidence is starting to become too bothersome. To, you can't dismiss. You can't say it's coincidence mm -mm. any longer. And uh, so a lot of colleagues are starting to step forward, and, um, uh, and a lot of ruckus is starting to happen because of it. You, under the direction of uh, CSETI director Dr. Stephen Greer, right. who is going to go to Washington, D.C., to right. a Senate hearing. Originally, wasn't it planned to be an open hearing and maybe covered by C-SPAN so that we could hear what you have to say? Well, that was my first impression when they mm -hmm. first started talking to me about it, and I went, we're going to be live on C-SPAN? Has we got news there? Okay, I'll, I'll walk over there and take a stab at it, and I'll tell you what I know. Uh, then uh, the, the rules started changing. Uh, mm -hmm. Right in the middle of the ball game, mm -hmm. you know, you get closer to the date. Now the press is not there. No, it's not open door. It's now a closed door meeting. And I'm going, um, this is not good, Toto. You know, <laughs> if, if we're going to go over and do this, uh, the, if we're playing a card game, the, the odds are starting to stack against us now. Mm -hmm. uh, so there we are under oath testifying to the Senate on things that we have firsthand experience with, and we being the scientific community that um, there are 24 other people besides myself and I'm probably the youngest there. Uh, a lot of these guys are really much, much older than I am and at their age will put them back into the Roswell events. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And so these were former powers that were mm -hmm. in charge, now retired, and they're in their 80s, some of them are probably, and you know, they're facing mortality. And maybe they want to tell maybe what they, they know. Maybe they will talk. Conscious clearing. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so they're making a, uh, it's, it's real, it's unprecedented. This is mm -hmm. a precedent. How could a person find out that this is actually occurring? Is there, is there going to be any write-up about it whatsoever? Is it a Freedom of Information Act or any, you know, <laughs> can they just shut it off and not let the, even the media know what's going on? Well, like I said earlier, I hope all 25 <laughs> of us don't end up on milk cartons, you know. Really? But um, uh, from what I understand, uh, the director, uh, Dr. Greer mm -hmm. has a whole series of things and press releases and stuff that he will do later. The reason they don't want to do press in a closed door is not mm -hmm. um, the way it's explained to me. It's not so much as covert going on. <laughs> uh, actually, it makes some logical sense. The senators that are wanting to get involved in this do not want to be tagged with this in public eye uh, so they can mm -hmm. come forward and do more researching. Well, that's a plausible explanation. But it sure sets the stage for a lot of other things that could really go wrong in a hurry. Uh, first of all, we're sitting there under oath. Uh, some of us uh, have top secret clearances. Mm -hmm. If we don't get the right permission, like from Janet Reno's office stuff, uh, we can be held for uh, treason because we're testifying under, under oath, under mm -hmm. top secret oath. Uh, however, um, it's like an oxymoron. You're testifying to the people you're under oath to, to the people that already knows about it. Exactly. It's, uh, it's really, it's <laughs> crazy, the whole thing is. Uh -huh. you, you know, you brought to our attention, too, uh, a lot of things that we have been able to find out sort of on our own as the general public or as journalists. It was wonderful to have you confirm it. And one of the reasons you're there, I've got to bring up, you started out as a very young lad, being not only uh, bright, yeah, but right. very, very bright. Had here hair. is some good proof, <laughs> some good journalist proof here. That I had hair once. You did. <laughs> Not only that, what, age seven, you started building a uh, rocket right. in your backyard, and right. by the time you were 15, you had persuaded a congressman to help support the building of your next larger rocket. Right. Uh, John Ashbrook of Ohio uh, had came into the scene, and uh, he provided some really major funding, mm -hmm. and then we led to a big rocket, which stood about 10 feet tall. and. Um, uh, I had been working since I was 12 on that particular design, mm -hmm. but even back at age 7 I was building mm -hmm. rockets. Uh, my first rocket left the backyard at about uh, 3,500 miles an hour. Jeez. And so uh, I was using cryogenic uh -huh. fluids and, and, uh, and I was using a different type of math called quantum mechanics at that time, which was 1968. And as a teenager still, you had the opportunity then to meet and work with Stephen Hawking. Yeah, right. And talk about black holes and everything that's right. going on in the universe. You have a wonderful uh, ability to show us how space might actually roll and how we can traverse right. those large distances. Yeah, that, um, Hawkins was always, Stephen Hawkins is he's such, a, <laughs> such a great person. And um, I got to know, I met him 30 years ago. and. Um, 
he was walking with a cane then, and uh, of course, most people might know he has mm -hmm. Lou Gehrig's disease, and he has muscular dystrophy, muscular sclerosis. He can't even talk now. He's just mm -hmm. muscles have melted away. And it's such a loss in a way. Um, his IQ has been registered at 250. This is a serious individual, <laughs> but he's funny if you get to know him. Uh -huh. And he's got a big heart, and um, uh, he's, a, he's a great individual, but his, his mind is in, incredible. He, um, it's been estimated uh, that his memory capacity, he could hold all of Mozart's compositions simultaneously in his head in the front part of the consciousness. You don't uh, meet people like that every no, day. And, and, and you ended funny. up being right in his league, yeah, so don't no, you discount that. <laughs> no, I, I don't think I'm even uh, worthy to touch dirt on his shoe. But, uh, well, you ended up building that uh, large rocket that got you to what? White sands <laughs> for it to be tested. Got me in trouble. And but. <laughs> then you got the, the you, know, you were first-hand at anti-gravity. I love that little definition you said. Oh. Uh, you, you experienced anti-gravity at yeah, well, 17. Yeah, well, yeah, the, the, it, what happened was when the big rocket uh, flew, uh, we had to go to White Sands, and then um, that day uh, they gave me predetermined coordinates where we'd send it down at after um, Apogee when we get to the... Um, highest point in our orbit. Mm -hmm. So it come down about 650 miles northwest, which puts you in about the middle of uh, Nevada, about 125 miles north of uh, Las Vegas. And, yeah. and <laughs> so we we take off over there. We're in the Cheyenne helicopters. We get there after about four hours. And um, when we get there, um, it's incredible. Uh, I expected my rocket down with the parachute soft landing. Uh, in the middle of a desert. Well, it was in the middle of a desert, and there was a rocket, but there, it's also in the middle of this 42,000-acre Air Force base yeah. that's not on uh, any of the maps uh, mm -hmm. I have. And uh, later, this is 1970, mm -hmm. and later you come to know it as Area 51. Right. We've talked topic. about that a lot. So, did you see something in Area 51 that is now the reason you're going to be in Washington, D.C. Yeah. talking about yeah, it? Yeah, what happened was, when we, when we landed, uh, this is my... Um, uh, first impression of anti-gravity. Right. <laughs> Security guards grabbed me by both arms. My feet never touched the ground, and I am just carried uh, out, of the, jerked out of the helicopter, thrown into this golf cart type thing, and we go riding over to a hangar. And uh, interesting hangars. They're huge, but they're low, low built to the ground. Mm -hmm. But uh, when we get inside, um, it's about the size of about four football fields. It's really big. <laughs> and then the whole floor drops out from under us. Literally, it's mm -hmm. a giant elevator, mm -hmm. and we go down about. So it's truly an underground base. Oh, it's huge. We've been told it is. Yeah, we got about 20 stories down, and uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's huge. There's a big arching roof, concrete uh, walls. The catwalks are built inside the walls and such, mm -hmm. and um, it, it's, it's an, there. phenomenal. Yeah, <laughs> uh, there was uh, quite a few aircraft there. The Northrop uh, flying wing was there at that mm -hmm. time, which is the twin of the B-2 stealth bomber. Mm -hmm. Okay, but the Northrop was built in 1949. Whoa. So why is a stealth there, aircraft right. in 1949 oh, yeah. sent mm -hmm. in the, here in 1992, we built a stealth bomber and they're twins. Where are these guys getting this technology? <laughs> you know, that was my first question, and they weren't really appreciating that question. But they a bright kid, but nah, I was mouthy, right? <laughs> mouthy and a pain in the butt, I think, but only because I knew. You knew things. I knew the human in the windows uh -huh. and the adult in the windows as, of, as an adult would, uh -huh. and I knew things were not right here. And then they wanted to show me something, and that's what got me in trouble, really. Mm -hmm. um, it was a device that um, was very similar to the ignition system and main propulsion drive of my engine. Uh, but it was, uh, mine was about the size of a football, theirs was about the size of a school bus. Mm -hmm. And it was the main propulsion drive engine. And we are, we're not talking liquid fuel or solid propellant, it was neither one. Uh, it basically works through an electromagnetic containment. Uh, fusion drive engine, mm -hmm. so it's a magnetic bottle holding a chunk of the sun inside. It's best That's best way to describe it. That's a good explanation, it. right? And so, if you open that bottle, you have mm -hmm. unlimited energy mm -hmm. coming out of matter spewing at the speed of light. Uh, theirs was huge, but it was damaged, and mm -hmm. um, and I thought, gosh, I thought I was really doing good. I was far <laughs> ahead, and here these guys had something a thousand times the size of it. And then uh, they asked me, "How does this thing work? Tell us about this." And I'm going, "I said, well, it works." This the principle of matter flow works like this, and I'm going, wait a minute, if this is your engine, why am I telling you about how your engine works? This isn't your engine. Where did this thing come from? Yeah. And, well, anti-gravity again. You know, they grab me, and we go through the air, we get back in the golf cart, and we take off, and uh, I'm, I realized that these guys weren't telling the truth. This yeah. wasn't their engines. Mm -hmm. And um, 
but the alloys were unlike anything I've ever seen, you even today. You that. that sounds the alloy is, is, was, in texture, felt like uh, human skin, mm -hmm. um, more like females, I guess, because it's just so soft in texture. Oh, smooth, very smooth. Mm -hmm. And as soon as your hand would touch it, the heat would dissipate rapidly. You could put your hand over next above the metal, and you feel your heat move through it, which was phenomenal. Um, it was transparent, almost translucent. Some of it was so thin, and you could mm -hmm. stand on it. It was so hard. Um, and there's just no alloys. I, I know most of the alloys of our time. It, and, um, it wasn't incarnel or carbon tetra de, uh, de bearings uh, type metals. Um, it wasn't Teflon. It wasn't uh, 444. It wasn't any of the schedules alloys that we knew today. Mm -hmm. um, the composition and the casting of the metal, that's where it got interesting. That's when I knew something was as uh, Sherlock Holmes would go, something's afoot here. <laughs> because yeah. um, the casting radiuses, uh, what that is, the metal is casted with a perfect radius and different tapering uh, thicknesses, seamless. Mm. How do you make <laughs> radius <laughs> casting seamless without meaning it's not being casted or forged? And well, even at 17 now, I, I fill in, your dad had a wonderful machine shop right. that you were really familiar with all the tools and all that technology. Oh, yeah, because... You uh, knew what you were looking at, right? Yeah, because uh, I grew up, um, my dad um, worked for a guy named Lee Petty, who has a yeah. son named Richard Petty. Right. He drives a race car. Yeah. And in the South, in Atlanta, <laughs> we all know something about King Richard. Yeah. But, um, so my dad was there back in the Daytona days mm -hmm. on the sand and such. So, yeah, think of the big machine shops we had. I was overhauling 426 Hemi engines when I was 12. Uh -huh. So, yeah, I know, I know, what, I'm, what, I know what I'm looking at. at. And what right. I'm looking at, it's not matching. Uh -huh. it, so in the South, we would go, uh, this stuff isn't from around the neighborhood, y'all. <laughs> you know, exactly. it is not from any known type mm -hmm. of technology we had at then. It was so advanced. Here we are 30 years later, and we're still nowhere near that type of technology capability. So mm -hmm. where'd, they get, where'd they get this? And it wasn't there, as they were asking questions about what is it and uh, it wasn't until 1994 that um, I come up with a design where we could shape metal with stereo sound waves from hi-fi speakers in a weightless environment mm -hmm. that's how you get around containers processing music is digital right, right? CDs mm -hmm. digital. what's digits y'all numbers <laughs> so right. if uh, music's nothing more than mathematical equations in mm -hmm. sequ sequential orders. So for every kind of corresponding shape in geometric universe, there's a corresponding sound. So by composing songs, you can do three-dimensional casting metal in a weightless environment with stereo sound waves. Mm -hmm. All right, this is 1994 I'm doing this. So here is a product of that type of technique and procedures setting in a hangar underground <laughs> at an Air Force base in 1970. And it's not until 30 years later we first really figure out how that's done. So we're going, oh, yeah. where did this come uh -huh. from? So, um, you know, of course, it's all denied that it's there and everything, but it's there, and I know what I saw. So I have never seen a UFO. I've never seen a pickled alien in a <laughs> tube, and, um, you know, I have never seen a ghost or anything like that. But I do know technology when I see right. it, and mm -hmm. I know when things are out of context. Mm -hmm. And our tracking lines of computer technology, we went from the vacuum tube to the trans to the transistor, from transistor to microcircuitry board. We're about to make another uh, quantum leap like that to the si super semiconductors. But you can track that progress step by step by step. Mm -hmm. You know, here we're looking at a technology uh, capability that had a surrounding infrastructure that's just now starting to be created 30 years ago. And then there it is, totally done, sitting there. And I'm going, boy, that, no, this, no, <laughs> no, this is not right you know so if it was a test you cheated you know where'd you get these answers does this reverse technology come to mind yeah what, what's happening is mm -hmm. this is more than reverse technology this is what they would be pulling the reverse technology off of mm -hmm. reverse technology if you're not sure what that is is where we see something so advanced or you have a very advanced machine you take it apart to figure out how it works so you go backwards and then you mm -hmm. can recreate it for your own use um, so what we had here was something they're pulling, going to pull reverse technology off of. Well, it's not long after that that we come out with, mm -hmm. you know, the supersonic planes, the swept wing forwards, the super alloys, and, and metal like um, your uh, carbon graphite, which, boy, now is in your fishing rods, your mm -hmm. tennis rackets. You know, th this stuff just come all on the scene all at once. It wasn't like back the computers where you step by step on the ladder. It's like 
there's no rungs under the ladder and you're standing on top of it. You know, you want to tell me how you got there? Because all these other rungs are missing on the ladder. How do you make such a quantum jump? And people just don't put these little dots in this picture together. Mm -hmm. When you start putting this together, you come up with a really strange looking picture. Like, how do we, how do we get here? Well, you're free to theorize. How do you think they got there with it? Um, the only theory that I come up with that matches the circumstances mm -hmm. will not ex be accepted <laughs> in 3D science. So I'm sitting here in a quandary. You know, mm -hmm. it's a it's a paradox. Um, I can come up with an answer that will fit this, the circumstances, but the answer is not acceptable. <laughs> and uh, so the only thing that I can come up with, you've encountered some kind of technology from somewhere that's so yeah. far advanced than we are, and um, that answers the scenario. But it's unacceptable <laughs> so the only thing I can figure yeah. we've encountered something somewhere uh -huh. now the circumstantial evidence is mounting all the time and it's been there for for years um, you can elaborate on the tiles for this well, the the thermal, shuttle too well yeah you know people think look at the marble at the thermal tile mm -hmm. you know here's the thermal tile uh, it's a it's a a block of material that can withstand 3,000 degrees temperature reentry. And you proved that the whole life expo. You were very yeah. daring. You held it in your hand. Yeah, we're watching the flame. It's, <laughs> the the, the yeah. substance weighs no less than styrofoam. Mm -hmm. You can heat it up to, um, well, that torch with the map gas gets about 2,400 degrees. It's cherry red hot. I mean, mm -hmm. you can see it from across <laughs> the room. And um, it's, no, it's only an inch thick, and my bare skin's on the inside. I feel no heat. But to prove the point, that it can do something that there's nothing else on Earth like it. It can stop the orbit of the electrons in the BTUs from building up and still leave the electrons in excited state. Well, what's that mean? It means we pull the torch away from the uh, thermal tile, still glowing cherry red hot, and you lay your skin right on the glowing cherry surface and it won't burn you. Now, come on, y'all. Right. You don't go down to Ace Hardware and buy this stuff, you know? No. Uh -huh. So we're sitting here. Now, I thought, well, there must be a technological backtrace on it. So we go to the abstract, uh, bibliography of abstracts. We look through the there. The way to trace those, right? Yeah, and mm -hmm. like you, we can do with computers. I can, mm -hmm. you know, how'd you get to print a circuit board? You know, well, we mm -hmm. had the transistor. Well, what did you have before that? We had the vacuum mm -hmm. tube. You go over this technology, it's like, no, it's all here. Boom, there it is built. And I'm going, Wait a minute, there's something wrong with this picture. How, where do we track our technology based on this stuff? There's too many missing gaps in certain technology tables that we have that something has come in somewhere and disrupted it and just gave you these big quantum injected leaps. Injected it in. Huh? Yeah, it's, yeah, it's a good word, ejected. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you sat there going, there's something not right about all of this. And it's all of a sudden, uh, the 3D worlds ask that question like, mm -hmm. Wait a minute. We just <laughs> naturally work. You know, you hand this stuff to us. We build it. We put it on the shuttle. We work with it. Okay, but nobody ever thought, how did we get here so quick? And um, and so you go to this wild scenario of why is this technology is not Earth origin mm -hmm. or dimensional origin? Good <laughs> God! Oh no! Get into that, that word. Yes. Yeah. You uh -huh. know, transdimensional jumps and uh -huh. such, which. Uh, Stephen Hawking and I had a great but time looking at now that. now there's, there's other authors, now, too, talking about hyperspace, proven 10 dimensions. Proven NASA itself has an office of research advanced programs in Huntsville, mm -hmm. Alabama, where they're looking at gravity wells, warp drive, mm -hmm. uh, faster than speed of light, gravity wells. Uh, they're looking at tremendous types of different technology, okay? Well, they're carrying on like this is the first time they're ever looking at it. Well, it might be. They already have some working models there, and what they want to do is condition you where they set up an infrastructure, supposedly, and they build it, and all of a sudden this technology shows up. It's just like all of a sudden it's now cool, we'll now talk about this. Where before, if in the research areas, 3D scientists, the real mainstream scientists would want to even talk about this, they get ridiculed. Oh, that's just bunk. Well, now all of a sudden the officials government agency mm -hmm. stuff says, well, we're now going to sanction you to do all this stuff, and here, let us help you along a little bit. And all of a sudden, this stuff starts pouring out, and we're going, where are you guys getting these ideas from? This is outrageous, you know? So all of a sudden, um, once again, things aren't matching mm -hmm. the technology flow chart. It's, you're cheating. It's just these big gaps. We're here. Well, let's take it on from here. Why? Wow, how'd we get here? You know, and uh, well, if you don't ask that question, just for the technology. Otherwise, we'll take your grant from you. <laughs> well, it, in a beyond 3D explanation, do you think the general public can handle 
the possibilities of how it got there. Oh, yeah. You talk to a lot of people. You travel to conferences. You see, thousands. you know, you see thousands. Of them. What's the general opinion? The, 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 the average public now, and um, I can even go more colloquial to southern Georgia, and we have... I resemble that. I'm from Louisiana. I know. Well, you know, the <laughs> Billy Bob and, yep. and Bubba and, and, and a good old boy. That's my cousin. <laughs> well, that's my cousin, too. <laughs> Baby George. That's it. Well, my brother-in-law, you know. Right. So we go down, you know, the, I'm invited down to their hunting camp, okay? Mm -hmm. And normally the conversation is, how about them dogs? You know, Georgia Bulldogs <laughs> yeah. and, and football team. Well, they just got to seeing uh, Independence Day and everything. So I'm sitting down at a campfire with them. And I've known he's been these guys for 15 years. And they finally just looked at me serious and they go, David, how about them aliens? And I'm going, how about choking while I'm drinking? And I go, excuse me? And they go, yeah, what about them aliens? That Air Force base out there. The government's been hiding all that stuff. He said, you know, if them old boys would land out here in the field, they'd come over. We'd, we'd invite them over to the campfire and we'd give them some Jack Daniels. And go, you, know, you boys ain't from around here, are you? And they're serious. And I'm going, it just dawned on me that the public has evolved over the last 50 years from Roswell incident, but the powers mm -hmm. that have been in control have not evolved. They're still in a covert mentality of the 50s. And also the power that's in charge right now, they didn't set it up. They inherited this. The men mm -hmm. that did do it was Eisenhower days. My God, they're in their that's 80s and 90s. Well, and that was a military thinking back right. then. Right, and so you just... Yeah transfer it to the next generation. Now this generation of power to be, <laughs> yeah, they inherited this mess. Uh -huh. And so like any bureaucrat of the 90s, they're looking for a place to dump it. Yes. Okay, so uh -huh. they're going to dump it. So uh, Do you think they're going to dump it openly enough or we're going to find out though? I think, I don't know, that's a good question. Time mm -hmm. will tell. You know, I was thinking um, <laughs> Brenda and David today, I really had fun with this complicated subject and uh, that's kind of what we try to tell you sometimes no matter what it is if you just laugh about it you know you can deal with it well and Mr. said is such a delightful gentleman there were connections between Roswell and what Mr. Adair talked about area 51 there are modern day connections that we will cover um, at one time I sort of do things backwards and I don't think I can say that word again. Um, back engineering. Back maybe? engineering. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, now I said it twice, so I'm going <laughs> to quit while I'm ahead. Um, other than my own life, looking at it backwards so I can make sense of it, it's kind of it's kind the same thing, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Yes, it is. And yeah. uh, other than that, I don't have a clue of what it is, but I understand you two do, so can you maybe explain it or, or something? Yeah. Uh, we, when reading the Montauk books, it was oh, the first, yeah. first time I ever heard about back engineering, and it seems right. that Preston Nichols was uh, involved uh, in back in engineering also. Yeah. In one of his time frames that he was right. doing. Yeah. Bob yeah. Lazar is also, uh, you've probably seen him on different TV shows, he's also involved with um, back engineering, and he got totally discredited mm -hmm. because he came out and told about it. And they even took away. He, almost his identity and said he wasn't who he was and had no credentials and didn't know what he was talking about. Same thing. He was on that show the other night, which you was never he? had a chance to see. Did not get to see Yeah, he, he was. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. That's on, on the ABC show. Mm -hmm. uh, so the name of it was Good. Confirmation. Uh, and that's why mm -hmm. we're really doing these programs. Uh, this two-parter here. Right. Answer some of those, le uh, those questions. And you, and you see the thing is here. The, is such a network of people available, uh, they're scientists and they astronauts and they doctors and psychiatrists and people like us, you know, so when you put it all together and lots of times when I go places and uh, I spend a little time at the, well, I spend a lot of time at the TV station now that, that I've learned how to do everything, you know, and it doesn't matter where you go the alien thing always creeps up and then people want to make it a religious issue which i don't think it is but i think there's enough of us out there that can make sense and it doesn't matter whether you're into it or not it is part of reality um we stated that on the first show and if you look at um some of the star trek uh, things that we have here um roddenberry was that his name mm -hmm. yeah. gene roddenberry 
he must really know things um, because, you know. He came up with a uh, lot, a lot of things. Well, actually, NASA copied a lot of things from mm -hmm. his show and started engineering some of the things, which mm -hmm. we feel he must have known something mm -hmm. because um, a lot of the things they say that people are saying now are things that uh, Gene Roddenberry wrote about mm -hmm. or, mm -hmm. you know, talked about. Mm -hmm. Right. And do, then you made a comment on <coughs> on one of our time shows that we did, that this is the year for everything to come out. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I believe that by the two, year 2000, we're pretty going to be pretty sure that uh, these things are real and true because they're just coming out. When they start coming out on television and on NBC, you know, mm -hmm. they want us to know something or they wouldn't allow it to happen because mm -hmm. they've stopped it before. Right. Which sort of brings me to another gentleman. Um, now, him I know a little better because I had ran into a situation and he was, um, he was very helpful because I only knew what to do part ways and then he helped me get the rest of the way and his name is Preston Nichols. Right. And Preston was? He was, uh, he's an electrical engineer, isn't he? Right. Electrical uh, engineer. Yeah, I, believe. I, said, uh -huh. I believe he is. And he's a genius also. Um, I mean, you have to be to do this back engineering because right. you have to take a Something system. Something apart you don't know anything about. Yeah, and nobody knows about. Right. And put it back together again mm -hmm. and then tell the government or whoever's doing this how it runs and why it runs. Mm -hmm. So he's very, very intelligent. Um, he all, you know he was on two timelines working. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, we're going to see a clip mm -hmm. about that here in a few minutes. Mm -hmm. But I remember the last time I spoke to him, and uh, uh, like I said, he assisted me with something. And we were talking about the Philadelphia experiment and things like that, and how people got into the situation in the first place. And he said that he's at a time in his life now where he wants to um, help, where he wants to share his time to help people because I believe in one of his timelines he was on the other side of the stick, was he? Yes, he was. Yeah. yeah. I don't think he had a choice though. Yeah. You know. Well, yeah. He of, was of pretty brainwashed in doing what he had to do. Right. Yeah. Right. Of course, if you run into <laughs> two lives, you know, two lives, um, sometimes when we stress out, we feel like we're doing that, but probably <laughs> not. You know, it's not I the hope same not. Thing. Yeah. <laughs> so, the, the clip that we see was Preston in it, and I believe that's only three minutes, and he sort of explain how, explains how that is possible, and that can also be found in the Montauk books, in the Philadelphia Experiment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And here again is Brenda Roberts uh, interviewing Preston Nichols, and that's a very short clip, and it's not um, as old as some of the others that we showed you, so if we, if we could run that for a minute, please, thank you. Actually, it's three minutes. Okay. To exist in a parallel way so that people can actually have parallel lifetimes going on. Well, time is essentially like a real estate. In other words, as you and I can walk through real estate from point A to point B, all time coexists and it's possible to go from point A to point B if you can find the path to go directly from. Some people believe it's taking the linear timeline, bending it over next to each other and creating a wormhole or a punch through from time A to time B. And so when you're existing at the, you're at the same time, literally, like, you know, you mm -hmm. can fold it over and wow, here I am, here I am. <laughs> at the, um, what about creating alternate paths then? Can, are we doing that with our lives because of that ability for time to sort of warp or fold over on itself? Some of us are doing multiple mm -hmm. timelines if we have the capability of going from, let's say, today to mm -hmm. two weeks ago and working the whole two weeks over again. What will happen is the first mm -hmm. pass will become an alternate reality since you cannot have a time paradox, which is mm -hmm. where you and you exist, mm -hmm. two of you at the same time. That cannot be. So one of the passes, typically the first pass, will become an alternate reality, an alternate timeline. Now what did they do though with Al when they, uh, allowed him to grow up the same time he was already in the Navy. 
Well, you know? owl story is a little bit different. Mm -hmm. They allow the owl to go through and have his whole life from mm -hmm. 1916 to 1943. Actually, I think it's 1947. Then they reportedly had the capability of regressing Al back physically to a baby and then sent him through a time portal and inserted him in another family and he grew up all over again. There were two Al Bielix. One is Edward Cameron and mm -hmm. one is Al Bielik. And even if they meet, there's going to be no terrible things happening mm -hmm. because of the fact that there was a step back in time means he is meant to coexist two places in one time. I did the same thing. At Montauk, I was working at BJ's. At the same time, I was working at AIO. Whoa. Did you get two paychecks? Did you get to enjoy no, all I that didn't. abundance? No. Oh, no. <laughs> that's, that's a shame. <laughs> I was actually working two timelines, one at BJ's mm -hmm. and one at Montauk. In other words, I would be in Melville doing my regular eight-hour-a-day job. At the same time, I would be out of Montauk doing my job at the, as well. Now, what would happen to my memories is memory is keyed in by where you are and what timeline you're on. Mm -hmm. the, as far as memory goes, the first pass through would become an alternate reality memory Although, theoretically, I could have called myself if I knew how to get through the switchboards and do it. And here we are again. <coughs> I hope you enjoyed that little clip. Um, we thought it was wonderful. Thank you, guys. <laughs> and uh, which takes us to a lady in Aberdeen uh, that we made reference yes. to on, on the part number one of this show. We went to Aberdeen and we were late. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, we were. A and the lady late, said, uh, we were, I, had, I had never seen the lady before. And she said, that's OK. Um, if you came from Olympia, there's a time warp. Yeah. And then what we did is, uh, it, it just so happened I had a camcorder with me. And so I asked her, would she be nice enough to give me a little interview? And she did that. Now, like I said, this is a lady I have never met before. I could probably go to Aberdeen with a camera and a mic and question many people, and you would hear the same stories. So I'm going to play that interview for you just to show you that normal people notice these things too. So if you'd be nice enough to pay the clip of the lady, and I don't know her name, I don't. No, if I were ask her or not. I don't not. think you asked her. Huh? I don't think you asked. Yeah. So we'll hear from her, and I ask her about the mountain, and uh, I really put her on the spot like Our I usually shop. do. We was a little late, and you pointed out to us that there was a time warp between Olympia and Aberdeen. Would you like to tell me a little bit about that? Well, um, sometimes you can go to Olympia from here in like 35, 45 minutes, 45 minutes, and sometimes it'll take you an hour and 20 minutes. It um, doesn't seem to depend on the weather or anything, it's just sometimes between here and there, there's just a time warp where you lose a lot of minutes. And it usually happens on the other side of Elma, between Elma and Olympia. Mm -hmm. Do you have any personal thoughts on that maybe? Oh, I don't know, maybe it's a convection. I, I really don't know. I don't think it's the SATSA plant because I don't think that it's really been in operation. But I had a friend who said they also seen a UFO in that area, so mm -hmm. I think there might really be a warp there. Mm -hmm. uh, does it affect your car? That, that any Sometimes that you it'll lug down mm -hmm. and it, it just sort of changes the um, operation. Mm -hmm. It's not as smooth. Mm -hmm. Anyway, it, uh, I traveled, I worked there for two years in Olympia, and it became very evident that during that time. I would just notice it a lot more that sometimes and it would just <laughs> take an awful lot longer. Mm -hmm. And like you said, it has nothing to do with the seasons or the weather, I just... No, 
really doesn't. It just sort of sometimes it is a lot. It you'll notice it coming from Olympia to Aberdeen too. Mm -hmm. um, it's either way, and it's unusually to, to me. It happens on the between Olympia and, and uh, Summit Lake area. Mm -hmm. Something I had noticed that um, I we didn't address when when we taped the first show is like the satellite dishes between well Alma and Aberdeen. You would assume they would face towards the Bremerton area because that's where all the towers are, the radio towers. But oddly enough, they all face towards sets up. Have you ever noticed that? I did, I haven't noticed that, but. Now that you mention it, that is true. Uh-huh, and uh, it's kind of strange that they would be facing the wrong way, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, we did some interviews with uh, Jim Clarkson. He's one of your local police officers here. Mm -hmm. He's also a MUFON investigator. So if you see anything, you just give him a call. Yes. And uh, we told some stories, you know, about a crash in Westport um, in the 50s. And so there's a lot of activity here in in Aberdeen. I think that's true. Yeah. So anyway, I thank you very much for taking time out on your busy day. And and we wasn't sure was we going to find anybody in Aberdeen that was, um, you know, that had noticed <laughs> that. Usually it's just well, us. Well, I have actually heard from a man who is an engineer who said the same thing. And a lady in Central Park had mm -hmm. mentioned it too to me. Mm -hmm. So, it isn't just me who has noticed that. But let me ask you this, do you go to Centralia sometimes? Sometimes. Have you ever seen a mountain on the freeway? The, the, uh, no, I haven't. Yeah. You mean on the freeway? Yeah, it looks like it's sitting right on the freeway some days, it's there and other oh, days. It's, that, it's like, the, is that the old Mount St. Helens, do you think? Oh, oh well, even if it was, it's it no longer in existence. Yeah. So it just seems to be sitting on the freeway there. No, I haven't noticed that. Okay, but if you ever see it, you let us know, will you please? We thought we was all finished uh, talking to the lady, but then it went on and on and on. And uh, she had lots of other stories to tell, including ghosts, and we will do that at another time. Now, you see our tablecloth here has, I believe, all the flags of the world just about. And I thought that was well appropriate today because it really does affect um, every country, every person on earth right now, the things that we, we are dealing with. Um, I only spoke to Preston Nichols on the phone a few times and I, was, um, I, I felt real good about his advice and the way that he cared for people at this time. And when we first met, you used to talk about Preston all the time and except I didn't know who that was. Right. And so, would you like to share some of the things that you know? Well, uh, in the uh, Montauk books, he he talks a, about um, the experience he's had at Montauk and the two timelines he was on. Um, when it, he didn't remember the two timelines until he started, uh, he built a T, Delta T antenna, mm -hmm. and he was putting it on his roof because he was doing some... Um, experiments, wasn't mm -hmm. it? And as he got up there, the Delta T bends time. Right. Right. And when right. it bends the time, it hit him. He was in that space. He remembered the two timelines he was on. Mm -hmm. And it kind of boggled him because he had been going out to Montauk and getting old radio things because he's a ham radio um, right. collector. Right. Enthusiast. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So they told him he could have some of this old equipment that was out there. So he went out there to get it. And people would say, oh, hi, Preston, and they knew him, and he did not have any clue why they would know him at this place. That would be scary. Uh, I know people see me in other places, too, so supposing something beams me, and I remember <laughs> I'm just two of me, oh, no, oh, no, <laughs> not good. <laughs> I don't think we could handle two of you, oh, to tell you the truth. not Lily. good. <laughs> yeah, so. But that must have been pretty scary, you know. I think it was, don't you, Caroline? Oh, very much so. At one point in time, when he didn't know he was ha on two timelines, he said he had his regular job. He just all of a sudden realized he had a Band-Aid on his hand, and he did not know where it came from and didn't remember hurting himself. So obviously that had come from the other timeline.
timeline. And that so if he had went to therapy, they would have <laughs> labeled him with some um, syndrome, I would assume. Yeah, you know, sure schizophrenic, have, perhaps. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, Multiple personality mm -hmm. disorder that I'm somewhat familiar with. I, I think that that's how he started tracing the fact that he was on two timelines, was he mm -hmm. kept, if he noticed a bruise or something right. that he didn't remember mm -hmm. getting, he would go to the nurse and say, was I just in here for a Band-Aid or, you know, mm -hmm. pretty soon they caught on to that, though. And right. They, and then, he, him, then eventually think. he hooked up with the people from 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 before, uh, Al Billick and uh, Well, what and happened Duncan, was um, when he was doing his experiments, uh, he was doing experiments with telepathy, and he worked with psychics. Right. And um, Duncan Alexander Duncan Cameron came as I'm calling him Alexander Duncan because he wants to be called Alexander now. Yeah. But we used to call him Duncan okay. Cameron. Yeah, that was strange too. I spoke to him that one day and he said, he said, you know, he said, I'm out of it of sorts. And uh, he said, do you know what's going on? And I said, no, not really. Maybe a frequency change or something. And the next thing you know. You decided to be called Alexander, which is his first mm -hmm. name. Right. Um, did, were you going to say something? No, go ahead. Uh, not yet. Anyway, he, uh, he, and his whole frame of mind has changed, so he, something has happened that has made him uh, less fearful of what, mm -hmm. what he did in the past. Anyway, Alexander Duncan came and he uh, said he would like to work with, um, he was psychic and he'd like to work with Preston. Preston. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, pretty soon they, were, they went to Montauk and they looked around and Duncan started telling him what all these rooms were and what they used to do in these rooms. And Preston was like, oh, this man really, you know, is having mm -hmm. some traumas here. And uh, that's when he started real remembering things. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't it that they had programmed Duncan to kill Preston? Right. Duncan had actually came there to kill Preston. That's what he was there for. But when he remembered, he, he said, no, I'm not going to do this. Right. Right. They had used Duncan in uh, <coughs> experiments to get two time tunnels, make, mm -hmm. make time tunnels, and they used him. And they pretty much burned his brain up. Yeah. And because of him being so psychic, that's the reason why he was able to function, mm -hmm. still function, mm -hmm. because of his psychic ability. Yeah. Otherwise, this man was like brain dead. Brain dead. Brain dead. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah, and the impact, when you see the two of them together here, originally they were half-brothers. Not Preston and him. Al, no, Al I'm, I'm sorry, Al, Al, Al and, 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 and Al, Duncan. Al and Duncan. Uh -huh. uh, Alexander. And then, then there's a 40-year difference, and it's so visible that it's mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's just to see the two together like that. You know, we know we appreciate technology, we appreciate, you know, modern things, but when we stop and think how <laughs> the price that we paid for some of these things, it's pretty, it's not so good sometimes, you know? No, it isn't, and you know that the back engineering they've done and the things that, this, that the aliens have let us see, uh, they have to have things better than that, or they're, you know, they're going to give all their latest technology to us. Mm -hmm. No, you they're know. still far in advance of us, or they wouldn't be. So, give, right, uh, you know, great free with right giving their their information out. And if they weren't totally you know, still mm -hmm. way advanced of us, so they'd have a hold. I'm sure they need to hold. I guess the things we talk about could be pretty scary to some people. Um, well, I, 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 well, you can, you can be fearful of anything. Exactly, if, yeah. You know, if, you're, if, if you're in that frame of mind, you can be fearful of anything. You have to think that knowledge is power. And the more you know, exactly. the more it's going to help you to understand and not be fearful. Exactly. So, right. so if, if it's part of your reality and uh, it feels like these are your next door neighbors, you are familiar with them, and it just becomes less threatening. Right. And we as people haven't mm -hmm. learned how to get along. Um, I got a phone call one day from a gentleman. And uh, I was very tired. I was so tired. And he, he called and he said, what are you going to do about them aliens? And I said, well, what do you mean? And he said, what are you going to do about them aliens? Are they going to take my food stamps? And 
I was tired and it just caught me off guard. So what I did is I just hung up the phone and I so regretted that. Mm. The gentleman didn't really care whether there were more aliens or not. He was just worried another species was trying to take his food. And so I really regretted having hung up on mm -hmm. him. And so sometimes it just Poor catches soul. us off guard. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yes. There are just so many people that we can talk to, that we can share information with. Um, I had a call from a lady that was in her 80s that started telling me about things that she knew. And it's just more and more, and it's there. And um, all we need to do is just <coughs> learn how to coexist. And, uh, and, I, and I think we'll be OK. I huh? think we need to, yeah, and be aware of where the, these, this technology is coming from. Mm -hmm. um, that, it, like, like Mr. Um, Adair okay. said, you don't make quantum leaps that quickly. Right. Um, yeah. There is, I mean, it, anyone should have be able to grasp that mm -hmm. that this technology came from someplace else. And if a man with that intelligence that can even talk to Stephen Hawking exactly is telling us this, mm -hmm. listen to what he's right. saying. Yeah, he right. really knows what he's talking about. Yeah, he so was boggled, so you know. Mm -hmm. But you see, he has that sense of humor that I'm always trying to impress on people. Right. Absolutely. See? Yes. And 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 that's and that's just how it goes. And I, I sort of in a way should really apologize for taking me out of that positive and happy space that I try to put you in. But needed to be addressed. Mm -hmm. And what we want to do, we want to talk about things nobody else wants to talk about. And so. Get things out in the open. They're not secret anymore. They're not scary. Mm -hmm. The young people have no problem with it at all. Right. You know. Mm -mm. And sometimes I think Furbies are aliens too. Just <laughs> <laughs> talking to you, you know. Yes. Um, so just just become used to it, and uh, learn to accept uh, things. I think learn to um, to say, okay, that that's the way it is. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, what am I going to do about it? I have this mm -hmm. information. You don't really have to do anything about it, but you should at least be aware that there's things there. Absolutely. Don't, don't be yeah. closed-minded. Open yeah. up. Yeah. And we don't have all the answers. Uh, nobody does at this time, as mm -hmm. you can see. But you can give us a call. The numbers are listed um, throughout the show. Uh, my web page is listed at the end of the program. And again, I want to let you know. Uh, you can get in the web page, you can go to Mars, you can go to Daryl Sims, you can go to Whitney Shriver, you can go to Dreamland FX, that's an artist that makes all the props for the different, um, like, like some of these here, and for, what's that show everybody watches, for the X-Files. Mm -hmm. And so there's so much information out there, and, and if it doesn't ring true with you, then like Barbara said at one time, um, just have fun with it, and that's sort of what we want to suggest to you. Right. Mm -hmm. right. And just because, like Mr. Adair said, you have never seen a UFO or pickled alien, <laughs> right? Um, doesn't mean that it isn't there. Um, we appreciate the cards that's been coming from Anchorage and Pennsylvania, even Illinois. To, on the way here, we got one from Missouri. Missouri. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we thank you very much for bearing with us, and we try to bring you some informative and enjoyable and funny <laughs> so shows for today. We bid you goodbye, and um, ho hope that you come back next week. And um, maybe we should bid goodbye more than once in case we're on two different time, <laughs> <laughs> two different timelines. You know. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, you have any closing thoughts? Oh, I think that it's been said before, but one thing you have to fear is fear itself. Mm -hmm. Open your mind and let love come in. We even know we're from p different planets of the universe. We're all one. Mm -hmm. And um, try to let love over your life and not fear. Mm -hmm. Excellent. And how about you? Well, I ditto that one. I think that's what we should do. We should open our minds, open our hearts, and... Um, Lear keep learning above all, you know, mm -hmm. keep learning and uh, enjoy the life that we're, we live here. And there's lots of books out there. They're not all on the same line. However, you know, just go read for yourself and make up your own mind. 
Um, there is a series of the Montag books. There is a series of Lapsing Rampas books that mm. we're going to share at another time. And um, let's see, did we leave out anything that was important? Probably. <laughs> oh, yeah, well, sure. see, that's, that's the thing. Uh, uh, sometimes before we come, we know exactly what we was going to talk to you about. And then when we get here, it's guided and we go somewhere totally different. But that is the fun of the whole thing. And again, for the third time, we will bid you goodbye till next week. Thank you for joining us. <laughs>